program started in uh, 2000, uh, a Women in History program. At that time, we had a volunteer named Peggy Knox, and Peggy came up with this idea. Where are you, Peggy? Stand up. Let everybody see you, because this has been your idea for 14 years we've been doing this. Ordinarily, you would uh, get a nomination form, and you would nominate a woman that has made a difference in the uh, in Douglas County. And so we've done this over the years, uh, and we've nominated a lot of people and gave the, the honor to a lot of women. All of the years and the pictures and the bios and everything about the women are in our medical library. You're welcome to go in there anytime and see if you think you want to nominate somebody, you need to go in there and make sure they haven't been nominated. In the beginning, we were nominating like 24. And then we got it down to where we were running out of women. So we, we've changed it now to five or six. So uh, I do have already some people that want to nominate for next year. Uh, we're probably going to have to have a jury to pick and decide on six because I see a lot of people have somebody in mind. And so uh, that will happen next year. We will have nomination forms. I haven't got around to doing them yet, but I'll take your name if you have one and a phone number and I'll call you when they're ready um, for next year. Um, this year, I, since it's 150th sesquicentennial, um, I did change it a little bit when I read that it was the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And I thought, well, that would be something good for us to do as a change. So that's why we're doing this and honoring, um, honoring the women that helped us get the vote. So uh, that's why I changed it this year. Uh, they are going to be doing Chautauqua performances. Now, a lot of you know what Chautauqua is, but maybe there's somebody that doesn't know. Uh, Chautauqua began uh, back in Chautauqua, New York, and on Lake Chautauqua. In the old days, they needed entertainment, so they got people together, they had music and everything, and they performed. Well, with our Chautauquas, uh, we also here have a young Chautauqua program. We've had this since, oh, I think 1999 or something. We've had it for forever. and. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our young Chautauquans. They happen to be here today. So uh, if Emily and Sandia and August would stand up, they're right there. <laughs> right now, they're going through their classes. And uh, thank you, kids. And they're going through their classes. They're researching their characters. They're learning about their characters. Uh, they will dress like their characters. You perform in the first person. Person has to be dead. You can't be alive. So anyway, uh, they perform in the first person, and that's what you will be watching today. Well, these uh, the uh, ch ladies that are going to do the Chautauqua on the suffragettes, they are doing everything in the first person. Uh, when they are finished, uh, there will be questions and answers. And um, our Chautauquans will be our our Chautauquans will be performing in Heritage Park June seventeenth, along with the. Winners of the essay contest that's going on in the schools that our, our education director Iris has put together. So the essay winners will be over there, and the Chautauquans will be over there. Just bring a picnic lunch and sit around and, and enjoy the program. It'll be at five o'clock on uh, June seventeenth at Heritage Park. Uh, after the program, uh, when the program is over, uh, we'd like you to enjoy refreshments. The refreshments are courtesy of Harris Harvey's. They have been with us since the very beginning. They have come through every year for us. And so I really, next time you go up there, if you ever go up there, thank them all. Because they do a really good job for us and they do a wonderful, um, they do wonderful desserts. And our flowers have always been donated by a wildflower. So thank them if you go in there for helping us out. Uh, now it's time to hear from our suffragettes. Oh. We forgot something better. While you're on your way out to buy your tickets to Second Hand Rose, raffle tickets from the Quilting Association are also available. And this is the beautiful quilt that is available this year in their fundraiser. 
And most of you have already talked to Sarah Jo in the back at the table, but be sure to say howdy to her and buy a raffle ticket as you get your refreshments. And you know the rule, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, nobody goes home till all the food is eaten. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn the program now over to our suffragettes. My mother, that was the last straw. 
She loaded up the old wagon with all of our belongings and took us to Soda Springs, Idaho. We were there a short time, then we moved to White Pine County in Nevada, and then we came here to Carson Valley in 1870. And we settled in Sheridan, Nevada, about five miles south of Genoa. And that's where I grew up. Um, my mother was a very strong-minded woman. And we had kind of a meager existence. Uh, she sewed, took in laundry, did that kind of thing. And um, she wanted to make sure Rebecca and I had a good education. So she borrowed every book she could get her hands on from our neighbors and made us read it. And believe me, we had to read it and we were tested because she checked. Um, there was one book on home remedies that I fell in love with. I reread that book, I bet you, a hundred times. And it was, um, you know, how you could make things uh, into poultices and, and herbs and items that you could use for medication. And I guess that's maybe where I got my first interest in medicine. So I reread that silly book a dozen times. And so uh, I, uh, I had an, a, a kind of an inkling or that I wanted, had an interest in medicine, but I had no idea that a woman could be a doctor. Um, and I had you know, a, a typical youth growing up in Carson Valley. There were dances, there were parties, and yes, I have never married, but I did have a bow or two. In fact, I came darn close to getting married a couple times. But my mother disapproved of the young men that I was seeing, and so I never married. Not maybe like you young people to do like today. I think you would sort of object to your parents being that strict. But, but my mother didn't approve of the young man, then I wasn't going to see him anymore. So. I uh, sort of curtailed up that sort of aspect of my life, I guess. And um, Dr. Smith in Genoa, uh, his wife had had a baby and was quite ill. And so he was looking for someone to help take care of her. And so I went and applied. And I took care of Mrs. Smith and the baby. She recovered. And during that time, when patients would come in, Dr. Smith would get me to help. And so I continued to help him until Mrs. Smith got back on her feet. And then he asked me to be his nurse. And I continued taking care of patients. And uh, then he told me, Eliza, you have a natural calling for medicine, and you should go to medical school. And I was, ooh, that sounds pretty good to me. So I read every medical book he had at least four or five times and he helped me get into Cooper Medical School. Um, today you would know it as Stanford, but when I went to school it was Cooper. And at that time in this country there were probably 75 medical schools. A handful would accept women. I will tell you that when I went to Cooper, I wasn't the only woman there, there were about eight of us. So it was a pretty good class of women. Uh, for the time. I started school in 1882 and graduated in 1884. Um, I uh, returned to Carson Valley. One thing I would like to mention though too, one of the reasons they did not want to allow women into medical school was that we were too hysterical <laughs> and too dull-witted to be good students. Can you believe that? <laughs> I did quite fine in school. I passed everything I was to take. So um, that just really made me mad. Um, so anyway, I graduated. I returned to Carson Valley. By this time, my mother had passed. OK, in those days, today it's a little bit different, ladies. Um, but in those days, you're in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, it would not look good for a woman doctor to see male patients if you were living alone. So I lived with my sister Rebecca and her husband Hugh. Uh, Hugh was a classmate of ours. We grew up together in the same neighborhood. Hugh and I were good friends. And of course, Rebecca and I had always been extremely close. So I moved in with them, and I helped 
Um, Rebecca with the children, and she helped me with patience, and you would hitch up my buggy for me, and I'd hitch it when I came home from visiting patients, so it worked out very well. Um, we had a, uh, a very nice life together, all of us. Uh, in about 1890, I decided I needed more medical knowledge, so I went back east. I went to the Women's College of Philadelphia, uh, Medical College of Philadelphia, and took some classes. Then I went to uh, New York Medical School and took some surgery. And then I returned, and I was going to be a big city doctor. So I settled in Reno, opened my practice, lasted for about six months. I found out that I had become a country girl altogether. And so return to Rebecca's house and begin practicing medicine. Now being a country doctor in the West was not an easy thing. Um, I made my own splints. I grew a lot of herbs and, and things like purple cone flower, spearmint, peppermint. I ordered medication by mail. Um, and those, um, you know, and it, to be able to give people things, you had to have it on hand. We didn't have a regular pharmacy in the whole Carson Valley. So you had to do what you could to make ends meet. And quite frankly, I have to admit that most of my calls seem to end up late afternoon or early evening. It's just the way of the draw, I guess. And so I would go and take care of the patients. And thank goodness, horses always know their way home. I would fall asleep in the buggy. And when we arrived at home, the buggy would stop, and I would wake up, and thank goodness, nine times out of ten we'd arrive home. Sometimes the horse would stop someplace he wasn't supposed to, but generally he didn't know. Uh, and he would come out and unhitch the buggy, and I would go into the house and start another day. But uh, that's kind of how the life of the country doctor was. Nobody needed a doctor at 9 o'clock in the morning. They always needed them at 9 o'clock at night. Um, I can remember one incident. It was a horrible winter that year. Snowing, helter-skelter, probably four feet deep. And there came a knock on the door, and it was a young man, and he'd been sent over from Pat Hickey's ranch. Mary Ann was in labor and was going to have a baby. And so the snow was too deep. I couldn't take the buggy. There was no way I could have gotten there. And so Hugh and a bunch of the neighbors fashioned a uh, sleigh out of I don't know what. They put me in the sleigh and hauled me across the pasture and over the top of the river because it was frozen. I arrived in the nick of time, delivered the baby. But when I entered the house, Patrick Hickey served alcohol to all those men that had called me. I was furious. There is hot coffee. There is hot tea. I have been adamantly opposed to alcohol my entire life. In fact, when I was about 14, I joined a youth temperance group by mail and have followed that belief all my life because I think that has been the most ruination of families, women, and children. And so I am still adamantly opposed to alcohol. But anyway, getting back to Pat Hickey, everything went okay. The baby was delivered. I stayed for a few days because getting around in that snow was very difficult. I did not speak to him the entire time. I was there. Not one word. Any message that I had to give to him either went to the children or Mary Ann. So young James did fine. I stayed for probably four days, then I returned home. And um, I think my opposition to alcohol, I became a member of the uh, Carson Valley Temperance Group. Uh, I became their president in 1891, served until about, hmm, I don't know, 1896, I guess, about. Um, and I still am adamantly opposed to alcohol. I spoke everywhere on the subject. Uh, the meetings were usually well attended by women, but those weren't the people I intended to inform. <laughs> uh, but I, I guess I didn't have much success, and I think that's what led me into the women's rights movement. 
um, was my alcohol beliefs. And so I joined um, the Equal Suffrage League, um, Nevada State Suffrage League in Reno. I became one of their uh, first vice, pres or vice presidents, served for many years, uh, became the president of the chapter here in Carson Valley. I continued to speak, Carson City, Virginia City, Reno, uh, any place that they would have me and listen. It was a long struggle. 1914, we finally got the right to vote. Um, it wasn't easy, and then, uh, and finally in 1922, the 19th <coughs> Amendment was passed. So you young women today are extremely lucky to have the life that you have today, because women in my day were thought to be inferior. We weren't smart enough to go to medical school. We were too hysterical to go to medical school. Uh, so it, it's been a, a very hard struggle. I will tell you some of my pleasanter thoughts in life that I've had. Um, about 1911, um, I told you about Eliza and William. Eliza was named for me, of course. Uh, she was Rebecca's daughter. They gave me a piece of ground on their ranch, and we both ordered houses from the Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> they came by train to Minden. We were hauled by wagon to the ranch. Eliza's house was much larger than mine. Mine was a little small three-bedroom house with a living room, a dining room that I used as my office, and a kitchen. And that was quite an exciting event. I mean, you know, it would, you go, went to the train and they unloaded all of this stuff and hauled it across the valley and the houses were built. I lived by myself for many years. I slept with a pistol under my pillow. <laughs> Um, you were isolated in those days, and you needed to kind of be prepared. And just so you know, I still sleep with that pistol under my pillow. So don't come knocking late at night. You might get more than you bargained for. My uh, nephew, David, now lives with me. And I think they said it was to help me with the heavy chores. I think it was more to keep me out of trouble with the buggy and things like that than to uh, help me with the heavy chores. But anyway, that's sort of my story. And uh, I've had a wonderful life here in Carson Valley. I was never really discriminated as a woman doctor. Um, I knew the people. They knew me. They trusted me. I probably may have delivered many of you here. Um, <laughs> broken bones, minor surgery, I did it all. Um, but today I just take care of a few nearby neighbors in my family and, and quite frankly, I'm getting older and I probably don't trust myself as much as I used to. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions for Dr. Cook, I will entertain them. I may or may not answer. <laughs> yes. I was wondering, did your mother remain in the Mormon church, and did you also, or did, because of that experience, did she step away from that? She sort of, <clears throat> we all sort of stepped away, but I don't know that it was because of that or because of just where we were located at that time. Being a Mormon for a time here in Carson Valley was not a popular thing to be. So it might have been because of that. I, you know, as a, a young girl, you don't pay that much attention to those sorts of things. Any other questions? Okay, I will give you my opinion about Dr. Cook. I think her opposition to alcohol had to have a personal reason for it. I think maybe her father may have drank. Uh, because she definitely was adamantly opposed. Um, so I think there is some, some reason that someone would be that opposed. I think her experiences in life with the father, living with her mother, actually promoted her to be a more independent, free-thinking woman, plus her mother encouraged it. Not many girls in her time era felt that way about things. I think another one of her contemporaries that was one of the girls that actually worked very hard for the Equal Rights Amendment in, in this area was Clara Hawkins. They were born in the same year. 
Uh, Clara, most women were more refined in those days. Clara was very outspoken, like myself. And so I think she made acquaintances and friends of people that had like thinking. Um, and so she was a very independent woman. Yes? What year did she die? Where 1937. She and she's buried in Genoa. Or not Genoa, Monsville, I'm sorry. Yes? Do you know what relationship, if any, she had with Dr. Mary Fullstone, who came after her? Much after. So I don't think there was much of a. Uh, they might have known each other at, in, a, you know, in a kind of a different frame, but not as medical professionals. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, your the instruments, the medical instruments of Dr. Cook are where? They are here in the Douglas County Historical Society downstairs. One of the first articles I wrote for the newspaper is also downstairs. You can take a copy of it. Her medical license, a copy of it, is downstairs. I own her house. I, I, I have her bed, I have her house, I have her diplomas, I have her medical license. She was licensed in both Nevada and California. Guy Roche and I argue all the time about whether she was the first woman doctor. I believe she was because she was the first licensed woman doctor. I have no idea these other women that were practicing midwifery or medicine were licensed. Nobody's ever seen a license. Dr. Cook has licenses. She was licensed in both Nevada and California. And then my second question, you said it was uh, Pat Hickey that you went to their residence and uh, with the delivery and that was James that you delivered? Yes. And do you want to tell us James, <laughs> James Hickey is my husband's grandfather, oh. and he became a local judge here in Douglas County. And uh, so he was, uh, it was one of, one of the worst snowstorms Carson Valley had seen, four feet of snow. People were immobile. And so the snow was so bad, she stayed with him for several days because she knew she couldn't get back. And so uh, she took very good care of James. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? All right. will be 
a possible yes vote for us. So we have to make sure that each of you do your work in this county. And that's why I'm here today to help you organize. Now, you heard Dr. Eliza Cook. She told you how and what she thinks of alcohol. Now, she also told you that in her temperance lectures, most of the attendees were women. Guess what? They can't vote. <laughs> so, right now, our biggest opposition, our main man who is against suffrage, is George Winfield. And George Winfield owns the newspaper in Reno. He owns a bank. He owns mines. He lends money to the liquor people. <laughs> now, if these men think that we have a hidden agenda, which is what George Wingfield says, he says that if we get the right to vote, we'll ban alcohol. <laughs> he says that we are unmarried women. Aha! We must believe in free love. <laughs> Not only that, we're probably socialists. <laughs> So, ladies, when you get those questions, make sure that you answer them correctly. You can go into the saloons and you can dance with the cowboys. I would suggest that you not engage in drinking alcohol particularly, but there can be light refreshments in the saloons because we have to go where the men are. And where are they? They're on the ranches. They're down in the mines. And they're in the saloons. They're not at the temperance meetings with Eliza. <laughs> so we need to prove that George Wingfield is wrong. We need to let these men know they have nothing to fear from us. We don't have any hidden agendas. All we want is the right to vote in 2014. Now, I, as an attorney, I live in Goldfield. Um, I uh, practice law. I'm also a mine owner. I'm a part owner in the Happy Hooligan Mine in Manhattan, where I first started when I came to Nevada. I also have a ranch in Indian Springs. Um, and I get around everywhere. And I talk to people constantly. I worked very hard in the legislature in 1911 and in 1913 to persuade those legislators to pass that amendment. Now, this was politics, pure and simple. And it's one of the reasons that the men don't think we should have the right to vote. Why, we're gentle souls. We're refined. Politics is dirty business. We don't want the women folk contaminated by groveling in the dirt with all those politicians. We have to protect the little women. We have to make sure that why they're not dealing in politics. So, we need to convince them that even though we are, this is a real political campaign, that we can do it in a genteel fashion. Now, as far as getting those men legislators in 1911 and 1913, we use some general
gentle persuasion. We have male relatives, and in most of these communities, um, the women have husbands and fathers and brothers who, um, well, let me put it this way, Mr. Legislator, uh, they could run against you. They might even be elected. <laughs> if you won't support our amendment, we'll work very hard behind the scenes and make sure that this is your last session in the legislature. <laughs> Well, it must have worked, because here we are in 1940. Oh, oh, hi. It's Ann Martin. How are you? Oh, my God. I've been looking for you for ages. Oh, I'd like you to, I'd like to introduce you to Ann Martin, who is from Reno, and she is the president of the Equal Franchise Society. And, and... I would like to very much. Although, actually, what is this thing? Don't get too close. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I don't know. Anyway, um, where was I? Oh, oh, I found you. I found you. Because we need to leave this afternoon um, for, for um, Smith Valley. Okay. Thank you for, so much for coming up north. Um, she has been spending the last several months down south in southern Nevada <laughs> doing exactly what she's doing here with you today. And she's wonderful at it, absolutely wonderful at it. Um, she even went to Las Vegas, you know, that little place down there, nowhere. Nobody lives there. Well, Helen Stewart lives there, but she's about the only one. And um, she has basically done a wonderful job down south. So she's coming up to help us because this is where most of the people live. Is here is up is up north. Um, you know, you forgot to mention one thing. You forgot to mention how we got the initial legislation passed. Well, actually, backing up in 1869, that legislature from wherever it was, where was he from? Anyway, he introduced a. a bill for women to vote. It passed the 1869 legislature. It was introduced in the 1911 legislature, and it didn't pass. Practically every legislature session since then, there has been some sort of attempt to get, to get women's um, right to vote. It was not until Jeannie Weir, in 1911, coerced your friend, um, what was her name? The one who actually wrote it? Felice Cohen. Felice Cohen. She got her to write the legislation that Jeannie then um, had a committee submitted to the legislature. 1911, it passed. Both the House and the Senate. And we know how. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might, but I don't. <laughs> I've always been single. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then um, in 1913, you came and, oh, I forgot, in 1911, Jeannie Weir, after she organized the organization and everything to do this, she became involved in getting the Nevada Historical Society started. And she was so involved with that that she dropped out of the um, women's um, attempt to get the vote. So I came back from New York and met you here, and the two of us got together and formed the Equal Franchise Society, and we've been at it for almost three years now. And um, since the 1913 legislature passed it, we've been working on it. Um, as she said, we've been down in mines, we've been all over the place talking to the men and getting the women to um, help us. Um, we also used to have teas where the women would get together and talk about what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And we call them pink teas. Because what man is going to come to a pink <laughs> well, we always had our knitting or our sewing or whatever it was handy because if a man did happen to come in, maybe it was his home, we'd grab them and we'd be working away at our handicrafts and talking. And so we had, we had quite a few of those pink tees all over the state. And I think they, well, obviously they worked because the 1913 legislature passed it. Now, next November 4th, 
the men are going to be voting. So we have, as Bird said, almost eight months to get every man committed to vote for women to have the vote. And we can't let them pay attention to George Winfield and all those rumors that he's spreading. Um, I first came to the ballot in 1906 from San Francisco um, after the earthquake. And I brought money over with me from San Francisco to invest in the mines. And I was a stockbroker here. Um, I worked in Goldfield and Tonopah and Manhattan. And I sold stock in those mines um, for my clients um, or to my clients in San Francisco because uh, the money from the Nevada mines actually helped rebuild San Francisco after the earthquake. And so I, I was involved in a lot of that. But I understand that you were born in Nevada. I yeah. certainly was. I was born east of Carson City in the place called Empire City. Um, I was raised there for a few years. My father was a uh, state legislator from um, 1876 to 1879. And, um, excuse me, 18... Yeah, that's right, that's right. My memory is going to. <laughs> and I'm not as old as you are. <laughs> to get a doctor when my mother was in labor with me, and he didn't make it back, so she and I were alone. Maybe that's why I really like my father so much. <laughs> and he likes me too, because he lets me ride horses, and he lets me play outside with my brothers. Um, my mother makes me come in the house and cook and stuff like that too, but she did, but she doesn't now. I just do it, because <laughs> uh, she and I are together. And um, my father died in, in 19. And, um, oh, well, backing up, when the um, mine industry went kaboots up in Virginia City, of course, the mill in Empire City wasn't no, was no longer active. Um, my father had the mercantile store, so we closed it and we moved to San Francisco, where he was a stockbroker uh, for two years. And then we came back to Nevada, but we went to Reno, where he became a, uh, oh, various various things there, but we, my sister and I went to the girls' school there. George, we that. You've got me got with that on my mind. The girls' school, and um, up near the Nevada State University Bishop College. Whitaker. Pardon? Bishop Whitaker. Thank you, Bishop Whitaker School. Oh my goodness, you think your mind is going on. <laughs> and um, the principal there was Johnny Rankins. I can remember his name, because he was so awful. He was just really terrible. And I kind of convinced my classmates that we should have a good time. And so we did. And when it was the year for us to graduate, he said, you're not graduating. You don't know enough. Well, my father said, yes, you do. And he enrolled me in the university. And um, I took a test and went in as a sophomore. And two years later, I had my bachelor's degree. And then I went to Leland Stanford University and got another bachelor's degree and a master's degree. So, there. <laughs> <laughs> and while Ann was doing all of those things, I was working because I was born on a farm in Sandoval, Illinois. And as a young woman, I moved to Chicago where there were more women lawyers than any place else in the world. And I went to court reporting school and became a court reporter. Um, I was then recommended to a gentleman called Judge William Morrow, who was a, a judge in San Francisco. He had been a, a representative uh, in the national government for the state of California. Um, and I went to work for him as his legal secretary. Um, he later uh, became a member of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in, uh, for the federal government 
in California. He recommended and um, helped me to go to Hastings to law school, which I did, and I um, graduated in 1903. So I kind of short-circuited my education and went directly to you know, my, uh, my profession. Well, in 1903, I was in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually came back to, um, after Stanford, I came back to um, Reno and started the history department at the university and taught there for two years. And, and, um, um, in 1899, I took a like, two-year leave of absence, and a friend of mine, I wouldn't call her a friend, an acquaintance of mine from Stanford, uh, Jeannie Weir, came to take my place. And I went to art school, I went to Chase and several other colleges, and then I came back after two years, and she wouldn't leave. Well, that was okay. I just didn't teach art, then history. But there weren't very many students who wanted to learn art in those days. So um, I, when, when my father's estate was distributed and I had some money, I just said, OK, I'm going to travel, which I did. And I left. And I went all over. And the way I got involved in the women's suffrage unit area was in London in 1909, when I was arrested in front of the House of Parliament for demonstrating for women's right to vote. <laughs> and a classmate of mine from um, Stanford had married a man named Herbert Hoover. <laughs> and he came to bail me out. <laughs> but we had, already, we had already been bailed out by our, by, you know, by um, um, an Englishman. But we were, we, I did have that honor of possibly being bailed out by Herbert Hoover. <laughs> and, um, so when I came back to um, the United States, I was working back east on the women's uh, suffrage movement there. And um, then when I heard that Jeannie Weir was, had, was introducing the legislation here, I got very interested. And when I heard she was leaving, I came back right away. I mean, I had been traveling around for enough, and it was time to come back. <laughs> okay. All right. So, we have almost eight months. Are you going to help us? Yes! yes. All right. and the miners and the other people, what words do we use to tell them why it's important that women should vote? Well, you're going to tell them that in the West, women are much more equal to men. We work on those ranches, we work in those mines, we take in washing. We are equal to men in the West and in Western states. And that's why most Western states have already given women the right to vote. Yeah, we're the only one that has it. Yeah, and we, uh, us and Montana. And we're all, we already have um, work equality. We work just as hard as they do. The other thing you can tell them is that they outnumber us two to one. So we're not really much of a threat, <laughs> even if you give us the right to vote, you're still going to be all right, because there are many more of you than there are of us. And Western men are fair-minded. So when you approach them with the idea that it's only fair that I have some say about our business, about our ranch, about our mine, about our children. I don't have any say about that right now. And that's why I, as Bert Wilson, wrote a pamphlet that was given, there were 22,000 of them made. Uh, to we distributed 20,000 of them. Yes, to give to every man in the state of Nevada, and the women too, to tell them 
<coughs> Women's Rights Under the Law for the State of Nevada. And it's a pamphlet. And it tells women what rights they have and what rights they don't have. You can tell she's an attorney, can't you? <laughs> Are there any other questions? <coughs> You already know what happened in November of 1914, so we don't have to talk about that. But is there any other question you'd like to ask us about the characters? Yes. What was the vote? Do you know? Oh, it was 7,900 against and 14,000 something for, I think, or 12,000 for. I, you know, that slips my mind today. But uh, we won by three or four thousand. We did not win in Marshall County, however, because of George Winfield. Uh, but because it was statewide, every yes vote counted. We did win in Douglas County. And um, there, are, there actually were women there uh, at that time. Most women who went to law school uh, early on had mentors. They either had family members or husbands, or they worked for people the way uh, Bert Wilson did for Judge Morrow. So there was a man there who was saying, you can do this, I'll help you do it, I'll show you the way, I'll help you get into law school. And in Nevada, women got the right to become attorneys in 1893, which was before we got the right to vote in 2014. Or 1914, the problem, the problem really is that without equal rights, the women could not own and control their own businesses if they were married. That's why many women who were professional women and who owned businesses didn't marry. They knew better, especially if, like, like Ann Martin, you inherited money because your husband then had control of everything. Well, actually, I inherited money when my brother took over my father's business. And I was the one with the business acumen, not him. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes. Could you tell me how um, passing uh, this amendment in the state of Nevada relates to the federal um, amendment? To, because if, if you passed it in Nevada, then you could vote for state elections. Yes, state only, right. right. Huh? The national, um, in fact, I, Helen, <laughs> Sorry about that, lady. Um, Anne Martin went back east and worked on the um, with the national suffrage uh, group to get the legislation passed in 1920, and that's when every woman in the United States could vote in United States um, elections. You know, I don't know if if a state had not passed an election for their state, could they vote in the state elections? Um, it, well. It, we have to think a little bit about that. We're, we are white women. So, and we lived in the West. So we have the right to vote uh, after 1914 in the state and after 1920 in the national elections. But in reality, African Americans really did not have the right to vote in this country practically until 1965. So you have a situation where both both black and white, males and females, if they were living in New York and Chicago and, and the West, yes, they had that right to vote. But it wasn't a real right um, until the Civil Rights Act in 1965, if you were a woman living in, in the South. What about Chinese or Orientals and um, Native Americans? Oh, but Native Americans didn't get the right to vote. Um, that, that, gosh, I, I, I'm thinking World War II times, 
late 30s, Sally, do you know? <coughs> yeah, but it was much later uh, for, uh, and, it, and the Indian nations, you know, all had separate treaties and all of that. So I don't think they really had the right to vote till much, much later. Um, and um, uh, as, and Chinese as well. Now, we have to again remember that the situation in the West was much different than it was in the South. So, uh, even though we, you know, were certainly not perfect by any means, we did work, you know, at least in certain aspects when voting, um, you know, up there. <laughs> well, not only that, but Ann Martin won for excuse me, ran for the Nevada State Legislature in 1918 and 1920. And Bird Wilson was one of the people who helped her campaign. She ran as an independent because um, she didn't win anyway. She ran as an independent. <laughs> and it did not win, but she did run. Why did you choose to be these characters? Are you related? Are you related oh. to yours somewhere in She's an attorney. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all comes back to a woman named Jean Ford, because we're with the Nevada Women's History Project, and when Jean started the project, she wanted to commemorate the national suffrage movement, the 75 years of that, and so she created and wrote a suffrage play. And in that play, um, I portrayed Bert Wilson, and so we performed in various places all over Nevada. I think you performed here. Yes. Uh -huh. A long time ago. And I've been Bird Wilson ever since. <laughs> I'm not lucky enough, though, to live in her house. <laughs> and, and I've done Jeannie Weir and Ann Martin. Yes. All right. Anybody else? <coughs> Wasn't the governor's wife involved also with getting the right to vote? Oh, uh, Governor Boyle. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, various. Um, the politics of, of the time and of the nation was um, complicated. Not that it's any simpler today, but I think it's always been complicated. But um, the parties lining up were not what you would think they would be when you think of the various uh, the politics of today, all right? Um, you have to um, you know, go back to uh, Abraham Lincoln and start thinking forward because um, Woodrow Wilson and his wife, for instance, were not very sympathetic to women's suffrage uh, and they were in the White House. So um, it, it just, you know, it, it gets complicated with, you know, when you try to say who was on which side and, and for whatever reason. But definitely the, um, the temperance folks were definitely on the side of women getting the right to vote. Because at the time, liquor substance abuse resulted in a lot of social problems. And women were interested, as always, in the fate of women and children. So that was um, that had a lot to do with, with the politics of the time, too. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today in Genoa. This is the first meeting of 1915 for the Douglas County Equal Franchise Society. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lillian Virgin Finnegan, but please just call me Lil, everyone does. It gives me great pleasure to thank my aunt, Jane Raycraft Campbell, for use of the Raycraft Dance Hall today. This is a special meeting. We have two very important items on our agenda today. First is the renaming of our organization. It has been the main purpose of any state or national equal franchise society to gain women's suffrage. That being accomplished in our state in November of last year, we would naturally turn our, turn our heads towards 
local and civic issues. Therefore, the statewide trend appears to be adopting the name of Nevada Women's Civic League. This leads to our next item on the agenda. The community needs of the town of Genoa in the county of Douglas. Ladies and gentlemen, women have won the right to vote in our next statewide election. So what now? What will we do with that right? How will we use our vote most effectively? Our Nevada Equal Franchise Society leaders, Bird Wilson and Ann Martin, will pursue the national vote, and we support them wholeheartedly. Yet, it has been our main mission since first becoming involved to protect our community. Our community. Here, our community is Genoa, and what of its future? As we see monumental changes in our state and our nation, we are also witnessing many shifts here within our own hometown whose future is in jeopardy. A community is the root system that feeds the larger tree. Here, our strength lies within our families, our businesses, our ranches, and our main street. Even before the great fire of 1910, Genoa witnessed many businesses and families relocating to the nearby town of Gardnerville and the new town of Minden. I can tell you, this saddens my father, Judge Daniel Webster Virgin, very deeply. He was a pioneer of this town who built it and helped to build it to what it was at the height of its existence. Genoa can still be a viable community whose roots are the very first settlement of our state and whose government is the very foundation upon which it was built. As we see nearby hamlets such as Sheridan, Mottsville, and Waterloo, they have disappeared or are doing so as I speak. We cannot allow this to happen to Genoa. As these hamlets disappear, so do their schoolhouses. Education of our children should be a priority for every citizen, even those of us who do not have children. The education, or our future, lies with the young people of today. Should any child be denied, the chance to become a leader of tomorrow simply because their family cannot afford the schooling necessary? Families who live in a community which is not prospering do not prosper either. Their ability to pay taxes is affected. To provide transportation for their children to attend a school in now another community miles away and of, of course the ability to save towards higher education. Now, as many of you know, education was a priority in my household growing up, that and the law. Father has been a lawyer most of his life, but he also served as superintendent of schools for several years. He would regularly visit each schoolhouse to become personally acquainted with the education that each student received. My late sister Ellen, my brother William and I, all were encouraged from a very young age that there was no limits to what we could achieve. Father was an excellent role model. He showed us that community service was a very important part of that equation. And he still is very active in our local Masonic Lodge to this day. Now, Ellen and I both chose the same vocation, school teacher and continued our education at the Nevada State University, graduating from the normal school program, Ellen in 95 and myself in 97. This is where I met dear Jeannie Weir, who was, uh, excuse me, 
who was a professor of history, of course, and she founded the Nevada, the Nevada State Histor the Nevada Historical Society. I'm so excited that she's here. It just I lost my mind. <laughs> She does not realize the influence that she has had upon my life in living by example. Now, most of you recall that Ellen taught school here in Genoa, in our little schoolhouse above Fifth Street. Our schoolhouse has become somewhat inadequate. Perhaps an opportunity will present itself when our county seat moves to the nearby town of Minden. The vacant courthouse would make an excellent building for a school. Now, Ellen taught here until her unfortunate accident, but I believe she still would be teaching today if she were alive. I taught school at Clear Creek over in Ormsby County, then later up at Glenbrook here in Douglas County. My teaching career was short-lived because I met and married Louis Finnegan in 1904, but I would have continued teaching if I could have. With our travels, it simply was not possible. This is not an uncommon tale. Most teachers are, of course, single women. I recall that when young women would come to Genoa, hired as teachers, and board with local families, many times the phrase, eventually, when one would come to town, it wouldn't be too terribly long before she became engaged to a local young man and father was back to looking for another teacher. <laughs> that aside, it is our responsibility to seek out and hire good educators who will help us shape and sustain our community for future years. Now, a strong community can keep schools local, but in order for a community to be strong, it must have successful businesses. And in order for a business to become successful, it must have, there are many things that contribute to that. Good business sense and the hard work of a family is one. My uncles, John and James Raycraft, they own several mining claims here in Carson Valley, but they also operate a stage business and a livery stable. When I speak of families, I am not excluding the women. My grandmother, Ellen, ran the Raycraft Hotel, even while Grandfather was alive, both then and after he passed, until her own passing just a few years ago. Now her daughter, Jane, carries on. You all know Mrs. Harris. Now when her store was here in Genoa, she ran the store for Mr. Harris, both before and after acquiring sole proprietorship. She needed to make the very difficult business decision to move the, the store over to Gardnerville where there was more traffic on the road to the mines. Times are very difficult here, and they're not getting easier. Why, Mrs. Felicity Allenbach, a woman well into her 80s, must still work here in Genoa as a seamstress, and a very talented one, as you can see. I agree that Genoa was declining prior to the turn of the century. However, I also observed that the extension of the V&T Railroad into the town of Minden has advanced our decline. Ranches are the quintessential example of a family-run business. Yes, here in Mark Carson Valley, we have many ranches. Also, in our community of Genoa, we too have several. Well, the Frey Ranch, which is now known as the Robert Trimmer Ranch, and the Adams Ranch, just to name a couple. Genoa is therefore important to the sustainability of Douglas County. Ladies and gentlemen, what I say to you here today is nothing you don't already know. I hope that I can inspire you all into action and realize that you do have the key to saving your community. Men will no longer have to bear the burden of being the only voice of the people. <laughs> Although,
<laughs> Women, we now have a voice at the polls. Do you realize that in other suffrage states, many women did not exercise their new right. In the very next election, following their victory, there should have been a full turnout of women voters. In the past, men have come to us for, adv for advice on how to vote on issues that directly affected women. We now, know, we now not only have influence, we have our own vote. I challenge each of you to go out into our community and find an area of need. Learn about it. Be active in the decision making and then take it to our next election for a vote. You won't have to look far. Our north side of Main Street still bears the scars of the Great Fire four years later. Aside from the restoration of the courthouse, there has been no further development on that block. And why must we still depend on a volunteer fire department 10 miles south of town? Genoa has had electricity for several years now. When will we have electrically lit street lights for the safety of our citizens? In most cases, money will need to be funded. Where will it come from? I can imagine that many of you are wondering why I am so passionate about saving a community in which I only now live part-time. It is true that after Lewis and I married, we took extended trips to San Francisco and the California coast. We spent much time in Goldfield attending to Lewis's mining interests. But my heart never left Genoa. I was born and raised in homes, not two doors in either direction of this very, this very hall. I have family members that live here and are buried here. And Lewis built us a lovely little cottage on my parents' property so that we would have our own home when we came to visit Genoa. If anything ever happened to Lewis and either one of my parents, I know that I would move back to Genoa to live for the rest of my life. And I want Genoa to live on well past my days. I will work side by side with you to make sure that that happens. And I do also want to share with you that Lewis and I are working very closely with Governor Emmett Boyle, who is working to adopt a law for teachers' pensions to be introduced in the 1915 legislature. Governor Boyle is also in favor of the national vote for women. He is a governor that is truly concerned about our future. I truly hope, and it is my sincere desire, that I have inspired you into realizing that you have certain talents that you can apply towards the prosperity of our community. Our community mirrors our state, our nation, and our world. It is our responsibility to vote for it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Stewart, who became a senator. 
So he was a pioneer of this town. Does that help you as well? She didn't tell me if he was a Mormon. Uh, no, he was not a Mormon, as far as our family knew. And uh, the Germans, yes, Germans and Danish and Dutch, they were uh, a great part of settling the valley of the Are there any other questions for Lily? Uh, yes. Did you have any children? I did not have any children. I was so busy helping Lewis with his affairs that, you know, I didn't have any children. But the years that I was a school teacher, I fondly remember working with the children in that and yet, yes. Did you finally live in your house and you know? Yes, I did. Mother passed away in 1918, and uh, father was alone. And after Lewis passed away uh, in uh, the early 20s, I went back to, to father's house to help take care of him. He was still working actively as a lawyer. I can tell you that there would be Horses and carriages lined up all day in front of our gate. People coming to visit Father and, and asking his advice. He passed away in 1928, and I lived on the in the house until my passing. Are there any other questions? Yes. You spoke about the need, the need for streetlights. Yes. So did that then lead you or others to uh, start the candy well, I was very involved in many of the community organizations, and I worked very closely with Ion Hawkins and, and Dr. Cook and several other ladies. And because of my role in these community in these community groups, several women came to me one day and said, "We do have a need, and we must do something about it. And it's not going to happen unless we raise funds, because that's how it happens in general." So I recall that I had been on a cruise with my husband, Lewis, and they had passed out handmade candy, homemade candy, excuse me. You know, that was a delicacy at that time. And Aunt Jane had the uh, hotel across the street and the dance hall. And we kind of put two and two together and thought if we all the women in town made the homemade candy, we had a midnight supper, oh, with linens and silver and crystal, and then went over to the dance hall to hold the dance, that that would be a wonderful <coughs> fundraiser. And we raised enough money for three street bikes that year. <laughs> okay. And then we realized, well, not only did we need more, but we needed to keep them lit. <laughs> so the next year we had a, a similar fundraiser, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and I believe it has continued on well past my own passing. <laughs> that was the candy dance. So what, yes. year, what year was its inception again? Uh, 1919 is when we finally got around to saying if nobody else is going to do it, we'll do it for ourselves. Are there any other questions? Yes. Is your house still there? Oh, the house is still there. As a matter of fact, I have it on good authority from the amazing Nabby Sandy that it is on the National Historic Register. That is aside from the town of Genoa being on the National Historic Register. It has its own status. So yes, and it's painted bright pink as it was oh. when, when I wrote it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Does anyone have any questions for chemical pills? <laughs> I've had a lot of fun doing it, but let me tell you, I am blaming Grace Bauer to the end of the earth. <laughs> Grace, you come here. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the board of trustees, as some of you may or may not know, and I'm sitting next to her at a board meeting, and she does not talk much about what's going to happen, except that, well, we're going to have a little bit different program. Um, for women in history. Kim, would you play Lillian Virgin? Oh, sure. I will not play Lillian She's She started the candy dance, you know. And so I agreed, and then she looked at me, and she said, oh, and the program is on women's suffrage. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew nothing about women's suffrage. I knew nothing except that Lillian Virgin was on some register for the Douglas County Equal Franchise Society. And that's all I knew. So I will tell you that I had to figure out why all these women would come to her, she had to be a go-to person. I had to look up what little information we had. And then I went to my friend, a.k.a. Jeannie Weir, <laughs> but uh, actually her name is uh, 
the dear Arlene LaFerry at the National, um, at the Nevada Historical Society, and I said, help! And she found so much primary source information, little tidbits that Lil went, you know, on, on the honeymoon with her husband, and then she was in Goldfield, and she did this, and she did that. I also looked up her horoscope for October 6th to find out what kind of woman she was. <laughs> and then I put it together. This has been a very difficult subject with very little information, but it has been a blast. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.